21st, 21st of May 2023, War Part 6, Unequally Yoked by Pastor Simon James. Greetings in the name of Jesus and welcome to Riverside Tabernacle. I'm Pastor Simon and it's my honor to share God's word with you this morning. We trust you'll find this message inspiring and uplifting. And may you be receptive to the voice of the blessed Holy Spirit. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we come before you and we bring your word to you this morning. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be able to speak your word to your children. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to your word. We pray, O oh Lord, that even as we dedicate ourselves to you for the next few minutes, yes. I pray, O oh Lord, that you will use us yes. as you will. That what I speak will not be my opinion, but yours. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Unequally yoked. War part six. It is common to hear people complain that the sweet person that they married morphed into some creature that is as far removed from the original persona as light is from darkness. Many, if given a second chance, would never marry the same person again, knowing what they know now. Hindsight is always 2020. Why do some couples experience so many problems while others live happily for many decades? One of the main reasons that I postulate to you today is the beginning of the relationship. The reason that we call or the Bible calls unequally yoked. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says this, verses 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Now this verse is not strictly, was not strictly mentioned by Paul in, in with regard to marriages but he was talking about partnerships in general whether it is business partnerships whether it is a, a social partnership or a marriage partnership we must be careful of the trap of unequal yokes <clears throat> unequal yokes means being in a relationship or unequally yoked means being in a relationship with someone who does not share your values or your faith. Now it comes from the pastoral uh, illustration or analogy of two oxen that are joined by a bar which is called a yoke. Their necks are braced in this yoke and they are both face forward. And they are, if they are of different strength, or they try to pull in different directions, they will not plow a straight line, and the work will be infinitely harder. So you want two oxen who have equal strength, so that when they pull together, the one doesn't go in front of the other one, they keep in step. And that is what unequal yoke means. <clears throat> and that is what the Lord, through his servant Paul, is telling us to avoid. Avoid being yoked with somebody of a different value system. This analogy is especially true of marriages. You see, marriage is a yoking together, if I may use the word, of two individuals who should share a common vision. If the husband and wife are not working towards a common goal, that marriage will not progress. It will either stand still or both oxen, the man and the wife, will be fighting against each other. Too often the husband's vision and goals are not what the wife is prepared to support and vice versa. The wife's vision and goals may not be something that the husband wants to support. And in that case, you have to find common ground. Now, without common ground, without common goals, a common vision for your family, common goals for your family, 
a common mission statement, as it were, for your family and for yourselves, which both parties believe in and both trust, you can never pull forward in a straight line. For example, if the father is a reticent disciplinarian, discipline is really the father's job. But if the father is a, is a reticent dis disciplinarian or doesn't want to discipline his kids, then he puts extra pressure on the mum. And vice versa in other things. For example, if the mum doesn't want to take care of the kids, or whatever her role is, these need to be calculated. They need to be agreed mutually between the parties so that you have a common, clear direction in which you take your family or you take your relationship. Now, the root cause of this crisis is often, it's not the only reason, Psychopathy could be a reason, okay? Narcissism could be a reason. There could be physical ailments or mental ailments that could be a reason for marriages breaking down. But the root cause of this crisis is an unequal yoking at marriage. An unequal yoking. The reason for this is, or, or the, the background to this is simply this. Let me just revisit the mental illnesses that people have. Many people are narcissistic. The world revolves around them. That kind of person would be a difficult person to live. Then you get people who are psychopaths, who feel no empathy or pity for anybody. Everything is just normal for them. And then there is other illnesses like the illness of bipolarism bipolarism is an illness and it needs to be <coughs> excuse me it needs to be diagnosed treated because if you refuse to be treated for whatever illness you have mental <coughs> physical you put pressure on the other person now, let me get back to unequal yoking at marriage. The reason for marrying and for ending up in an unequally yoked marriage was either a physical or material decision. Let me explain. Whereas God intended marriage to be a spiritual union of two souls, most people marry for physical or material benefit. They marry for what they can see, what they can feel. Now, what you see and what you feel is not always permanent. Now, of all the characteristics of love, the best for me is that true love is a spiritual connection. True love is not a physical connection. It is a spiritual union. The spiritual always outlasts the physical. You see, gravity, time, and disease wreak havoc on the human body. It re 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 wreaks havoc on anything that is physical or material. As we age, our bodies lose their attractiveness. But the mind and soul retain their attraction or their attractiveness. And sometimes they even grow. People should try to unite on a spiritual level. For long-term success, one must marry someone they connect with spiritually. When the body is gone, when the body is weak, when the flesh is weak, the spirit must remain strong. When the physical pleasures of life have departed and there are no more, what is left? But the ability to converse, the ability to connect spiritually and mentally, intellectually. 
I want to give you an example of an intellectual marrying someone who cannot meaningfully converse with them, makes them or makes for them a very lonely life for both of them. Because I have seen a marriage and many marriages where the husband or the wife is an intellectual, the wife or the husband is not. And you can see now that the physical pleasures have gone, they just can't connect. They cannot reach common ground and they end up in an argument of frustration because each cannot really talk to the other. Marrying a person given to a habit is the same. Do never, do, do not believe, and women are the most vulnerable to this misconception, I would call it. Do not believe that if you marry somebody who has a bad habit, whatever he is, I'm not interested in the habit, whatever the habit is, that you or your influence is going to change that person. If he's doing that or she's doing that, only they can want to change it. You can want all you like to change it. It doesn't change. They must want to do it and you must understand that, that they may not ever want to change. It is a, it is a risk that you, you must take. I mean that you, you are taking and you must be informed when you make the decision to say I do. Perhaps the most, so perhaps the area of most importance to the believer in the terms of unequally yoking is the issue of religion, is, is the issue of God. We are told to marry those who are of the same faith. If you read Ezra, you will find there were times when, when men sent away the wives or the concubines they've taken from other countries, other religions, pagan worshippers, because they were polluting the religion that we believe in. They were polluting the worship of Yahweh or Jehovah. The Bible encourages us. It doesn't force us. It encourages us to marry those of, who are of the same faith as us. Now this rule, while it's not hard and fast, eliminates the confusion which faces the children later and the inevitable arguments about the choice of deity to serve, it eliminates a lot of the problems in the family. Two people cannot live together unless they agree. The spirits that control each do not agree and problems result. Now today I want to take you through two people, two men, and possibly uh, uh, one or two women, about marriage. Now what, what, what I'm saying to you about these men and these women applies equally across both the sexes, both the genders. Okay? It applies to the man and to the woman. Now let's talk about Samson, the man who wanted his way. Samson was a chosen champion of the Lord, yet he was as headstrong as they came. He broke tradition by consorting with foreign pagan women rather than marrying a Jewish girl. The Jewish girls were not as physically appealing to him as the Philistine women were. And when you read through the Bible, the Old Testament, you find that the Israelite men often found the women of the nations around them much more attractive, more sexually appealing, or as we say, they were sexier. And I suppose that it was the way they dressed or the way they carried themselves, the things that they did in their worship, because a lot of the pagan worship happened when people were hardly clothed or totally naked. And they didn't have the rules that Jehovah God gave to the Israelites. So Samson found that he could do things with these Philistine women that Jewish women wouldn't even think about. You get, you catch my drift. So he was attracted to them. They, he was attracted to their culture. He was attracted 
to their physical looks. And culture is a big problem when you marry across the cultural line. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, I'm not advocating that one never marries across color lines or across culture lines. But I'm saying to you that it is the honorable thing. It is the wisest thing to do when choosing a partner to marry someone who is saved, someone who knows the Lord Jesus Christ and is actively serving them, not someone who tells you they know the Lord. Samson married a foreigner who did not serve the Lord. Now this was his first woman that he married. He married this woman. When he saw this woman at whatever function or club or whatever it was in those days, he saw he was attracted to her. He went to his parents and he issued them an ultimatum. He said, get me this woman to wife. And his mother and father said, are they not good girls in Israel? Within the Israelite nation. Why do you have to go out? There's 12 tribes in Israel. There's 12 different strains of women. Can't you find one of the 12 beautiful? There were probably millions of uh, girls by then. And Samson said, no, I want this girl. I want her. Go and get her for me. So the father did that. They went and because that was how it was then. The fathers went and arranged it. The marriage was arranged. Samson broke God's law again by touching a dead carcass. You know, he killed a lion. The lion, a bees uh, uh, put uh, bees started building a hive and, and he found honey in the carcass. He ate that. He even defiled his parents by giving them to eat. And there was a riddle, all that. I won't go into all that. But the upshot of it is that Samson had a falling out with the Philistines with his father-in-law. And he lost his wife because his wife was taken and given to his best man. Well, that's one marriage where the best man was the best man. Now, their culture and customs are different from those of the Israelites. Whereas Samson was betrothed to, if, if Samson was betrothed to an Israelite woman, she was his wife for life, even though they had not consummated the marriage. But in this case, it was easy for the father to take her and give her to somebody else. Now, yes, God allowed this to happen, and he used it to destroy a thousand Philistines and 30, uh, I can't remember the other uh, uh, people from another nation. With the jawbone of an ass, Samson killed a thousand Philistines. He then consorted to comfort himself. He consorted with a prostitute. He went into a prostitute. He stayed over with a prostitute. Again, he was defiling himself because he was a judge of Israel, which was the equivalent of a prophet in those days. Now, the great young judge of Israel had lost his way. And scholars say that Samson wasn't very old. He probably was in his 20s or maybe early 30s at most. He lost his way. As the judge of Israel, Samson had destroyed his testimony. People could not look at Samson anymore and say, there's a perfect example of what a young man should be. He who was judging the nation of Israel was committing the sins which he judged. You see, this is the problem of being unequally yoked. He was unequally yoked to the Philistine woman. Then he was unequally yoked to the prostitute. The Bible says, what, uh, what benefit is that to us if we join ourselves to the prostitute? And to add insult to injury, Samson went ahead and fell in love with Delilah, who was another Philistine woman. He was, she might have been a very, very beautiful woman, but he fell in love with her. He loved her. And Delilah was a trap and his downfall. She was used by the devil to do to Samson. What no mortal man could ever do or even dream of doing. Samson was the strongest person on earth. But she, a woman, a mere woman, brought him down. She single-handedly destroyed the mighty Samson. Not with a sword, but with a kiss. She enticed him to tell her the secret of his strength. 
And in that melee of sex and debauchery and fun that he was having and drinking that he was having with her, she was able to entice him to tell her, tell her his secret, which he did. And then she sold him out to the Philistine, his sworn enemies. You see, when God has a plan for you, be sure that Satan has a counter plan. Satan is not in hell, like many think. Satan is not stupid, like many think. Satan is not even defeated, like many think. He's not defeated. God has not defeated him. God has bruised his head, but he's not defeated. The ultimate defeat is still to come. God has allowed Satan a run of this world. So Satan is constantly, continuously observing those whose eyes, uh, whose, uh, who ha, who, on whom God's eyes falls so that he can counter and thwart, destroy God's plans. You see, God's plan for Samson was to rule Israel and, and be an example to others. To help Israel to move forward, to judge them, to help them judge, in other words, means guide them. Satan's plan was to engineer Samson's downfall. He wanted to take Samson out of the equation. If he took Samson out of the equation, he could take over Israel and destroy the nation of Israel. Knowing that Samson was undefeatable in battle, Satan set an enticing trap for him in the form of a beautiful woman. Now many chosen vessels of the Lord, both men and women, have allowed their testimonies in their lives to be ruined by choosing a partner who was not saved or who is not saved. Ironically, Samson's lustful eyes were gouged out when he was captured. Same eyes that observed this beautiful woman that got Samson in trouble were gouged out <clears throat> when he was captured. Now you must understand, many of us want to be in the ministry. Many of you want to be in the ministry. You have a calling. Whatever it is, ministry as a minister, ministry as a Sunday school teacher, an evangelist, maybe just the caretaker of the church, whatever it is, it is fine. But if you've married unequally, if you've unequally yoked to their partner, I can tell you that when the time comes for you to answer your calling, when God says it is time for you to get into the ministry, that is a time the unaligned spouse will rear its head. That is when the dragon in your marriage will rear its head or the tiger will growl. That is a time when people will say to you, your spouse will say, you're not going to church. I'm not interested in supporting this. God didn't call me. I'm not interested. I can't support this. And you will have a trouble. That's a, that's a problem with being unequally yoked. Now let's talk about another man. Another man, and his name is Isaac. Now here's is a man who wanted God's way. He wanted God's way to be his way. Now Isaac at 40 years old met his wife. He was 40 years old when he married Rebecca. He didn't have a girlfriend. He didn't consort with women of other nations or nationalities. He married one woman. He was also a man chosen by the Lord as Samson was. He was rich and he could have married any woman in the land, but he allowed his father to choose his bride. Abraham wanted a suitable partner for his son Isaac. And Isaac was happy to accept his father's decision without question. God as your father also wants the best partner for you. But are you prepared to wait like Isaac or are you like Samson who wanted what he wanted? Samson who was possible in his 20s as I said decided for himself with tragic results. Now, I'm not saying that everybody who chooses a partner on their own will have a tragic result, but I want to tell you that many people marry a trap. 
Two people, many Christians marry a trap, especially the chosen ones. Now two people cannot live together in harmony if they do not serve the same God. Believe you me, if they do not serve the same God, or they do not strive to be, if they might not be on the same equal level in terms of the spirit, uh, spiritual matters, but if they're not striving to be the best they can be and have a good relationship with God, they cannot live in harmony. It is a no can do. And it will be strife between the spirit of between the spirits that control the one and the Holy Spirit. Now, whereas a married couple ought to be a single spiritual entity, there will be two separate and warring spirits. This might not happen for, for as long as the chosen vessel refrains or refuses its God-given assignment. But once a partner decides to take, take up or answer their calling, all, hell's breaks, all hell breaks loose. Notice that although Abraham had a wife and a concubine, and then later another wife, so Abraham had two wives, he had a wife and a concubine, and then when his wife died, when Sarah died, he married Keturah. Jacob also had two wives and two concubines. He took it to the limit. Although father Abraham had three wives, basically, and Jacob had four. Jacob was Isaac's son. Isaac had only one, his beloved Rebecca. And this brings me to Rebecca. I promise I'll talk to you about a woman. This brings me to Rebecca. She was prepared to leave her family to travel to an unknown land to be married to an unknown man. She had not seen Isaac before, and it's possible that she'd not even heard of her cousin. Basically, they were related, but she hadn't known. She probably knew there was an uncle, a great uncle living called Abraham living there. She might have known that he had a son, but she didn't know anything about them because they lived so far away. Yet when she was called, she answered. Because the call, she knew the call was from God and not from Abraham. She trusted God that a man who was of her family and served her God like her would be the perfect match. You see, she married within her religion. She married within her faith. She married somebody that she could be equally yoked to. And Isaac was pleased to marry her. Not because he was beautiful or whatever, but because he trusted his father's wisdom. And if his father said she was the girl for him, he was going to marry her. Now, Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac's and Rebecca's marriage might not qualify as a love marriage. In terms of nowadays, it was an arranged marriage. But they married for God. Yes, they married for God. And God is love. Even so, they married for the right reasons. They married to reflect God's image, number one. Be each other's closest companion, number two. And procreate, number three. This is the ep epitome of a marriage arranged by the Lord. There are other people as well that you can look at. The young widow Ruth, the Moabites, uh, the, Mo uh, the, uh, the Moabites, widow Ruth you can follow her story if you read her story she was also a very good example of what a young woman should be and her husband Boaz was exactly what God wants a man to be now as I close I'm hit 30 minutes so I want to close Samson or Isaac which is it going to be which are you going to be or which are you try, striving to be when it comes to finding the perfect partner, it is wise to remember the phrase, pray or pay. This simply means that if you don't pray the right person into your life, you will pay the price later for the wrong person in your life. Rather pray now and get the right partner. It will save many tears, sleepless nights, divorce or death. Do not marry for physical looks alone. I'm not telling you to go look for the ugliest person now, in your opinion, and marry them. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. I'm saying make sure that you don't just connect on a physical level, 
but that you connect on an intellectual and more by especially spiritually you're compatible. Samson did not waste time praying for a wife. Now did Isaac pray? Yes. Isaac was praying. Samson did not waste time praying for a wife. He married a wife whom he never had. He slept with a prostitute who he could never marry. And he loved a woman who deceived him. Who never loved him. She was using him. Isaac's wife was the result of prayer. Isaac himself was a man of, man of prayer. How do we know this? When Rebekah first laid eyes on Isaac, he was in the field praying. Go and read the Bible. You'll see it there. Good spouses are seldom found. Now this is a tip that I learned. Good spouses are seldom found in bars and nightclubs. Rather look for your partner in church. It is not a shame to pray for a partner. It doesn't mean that you will get left on the shelf or you'll be a wallflower if you do not, if you keep praying for a partner. I also thought it was a joke when I was young to pray for a partner. But I can tell you, I have seen many people suffer because they refuse to pray. Be like Isaac, not like Samson. We trust you've enjoyed God's word and that it has been a blessing to you. If you're inspired by it, please share it with your friends and family. Remember, we're live on Facebook every Wednesday at 7 p.m. and Sunday at 10 a.m. Please visit our YouTube channel. Click the like button. Subscribe. We have 51 subscribers. We need a lot more for YouTube to publish these messages. If you think these messages could benefit even one person, then please go on to our channel. Like it and subscribe it. This is Pastor Simon. And as always, it has been my pleasure. Till next time, God bless.